Hi, and welcome to Take Every Thought Captive, our weekly look at the Catholic intellectual tradition and an exploration of the authors, books, and topics that have shaped Catholic thinking for 2,000 years. My name is Jason Gale, and I'm joined this week again by Dr. Benjamin Smith, our lecturer in philosophy at Catholic Studies Academy. And today we're going to continue our conversation on modern philosophy with uh, looking at the figure of David Hume. Uh, for our listeners, last week we kind of began with uh, um, a real introduction and uh, historical context of the period that we call modern philosophy, which kind of is, you know, the 16th century up until about the 19th century. Uh, and today we, what we want to do is continue that discussion about uh, uh, one of the most influential figures during that time, and that is the person of David Hume. And so, Dr. Smith, to, to get us started, I mean, David Hume is not you know, for, I think for the for most of our listeners, he's not up there with Plato or Aristotle, <laughs> sure. you know, or even St. Thomas, you know, so mm. uh, uh, it may be the, it may be new to him. So maybe it, give us a quick introduction and maybe talk a little bit about his how influential he was, not just then, but but even now. OK, great. Yeah. So David Hume is uh, 18th century um, so in the 1700s, working in the 1700s, um, 18th century uh, Scottish philosopher. Uh, interestingly, um, for most of his um, uh, life, he was, or for most of his adult life, he was uh, a librarian, actually, interestingly wow. enough. Um, and that's because he couldn't get a teaching position. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and he couldn't get a teaching position because he was so notorious. Um, that is, he was a very controversial figure in his own time. Um, it's interesting when you really, there's sort of two sides of David Hume. Yeah. Uh, when you read, um, when you read his works and read about how people reacted to him, I mean, he, he really was sort of one of the first early notorious public intellectuals in uh, England, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. They, they really, like, he was considered to be an atheist, to be agnostic. Sometimes he had a hard time getting his works published. Yeah, um, those sorts of things. Um, so he was, he, you know, he was able to get a job as a librarian, and it was, you know, I think grateful to have it. But uh, but he couldn't get a teaching position because most teaching positions still in England at the time required you to um, be, um, I think, at least a member of the Church of England or the Church of Scotland, sure, um, and that sort of thing. So he was not in good standing with those churches. <laughs> so, um, He's also, a funny thing, though, is he was known to be, like, if you, there's a famous, if you Google David Hume, you'll be able to pull up this funny little painting of him. Yeah. And he, like, uh, he looks, it's a painting that looks very much like any, any painting of an 18th century English gentleman. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, kinda, yeah, yeah. He kind of has this double chin, and he has on a wig, and he looks, he, he's smiling. He's got the red, the red coat. Yeah, 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 and he's smiling kind of in a cheery way. And he was known, actually. Is being a very cheerful guy. Actually, people loved to, uh, to invite him to parties. Then he had he formed long friendships with people, uh, including people like uh, very famous people like Adam Smith. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think about Adam Smith is really one of the uh, who kind of initiated classical or one of the primary premier members of classical economics. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, he was uh, notorious. Uh, he did. Uh, he was beloved by his friends, though, um, and uh, but also very influential. So, mm -hmm. as I say, he was uh, friends with Adam Smith. Uh, he was a huge influence on uh, Charles Darwin um, and on Jeremy Bentham, yeah. uh, later utilitarian philosopher. Um, so, and, and, you know, say he was well known during his time, and and, yeah. uh, and even uh, Kant, right? That's right. In fact, most importantly, Kant, because Kant, you know, uh, is, is his famous saying, right, that, uh, that David Hume um, uh, disturbed him from his dogmatic slumbers or woke him from his dogmatic yeah. slumbers, right? And he was the of, first to be woke. We can, we can establish <laughs> that right here. He was woke before it was cool. Before it was cool. <laughs> oh, my. Oh, my. Yeah. Uh, anyways, um, the... Uh, you know, really a lot of Immanuel Kant's sort of work that we think of as his main work mm -hmm. uh, was in reaction to David Hume. And so a lot of ways, you know, uh, and engaging with Hume and trying to overcome some of the problems that Hume um, kind of um, developed. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, so it, you know, insofar as, you know, as our listeners have, are by now, I'm sure, 
aware of. I, I tend to think that Immanuel Kant's the most important modern philosopher in terms of like what we deal with today. Sure, um, sure. But Hume is really sort of in the background there, right? Yeah, as, yeah, yeah. as really getting Hume, uh, as getting Kant going. In addition to that, you know, Hume uh, kind of had a second act uh, after he was dead, posthumously, um, that is uh, modern British philosophers, modern analytic philosophers, early, these are British philosophers working in the beginning of the 20th century, really sort of uh, revived David Hume as sort of their kind of ancestor or forefather mm, um, and adopted a lot of his criticisms, a lot of his skeptical arguments. They developed them further. And so today, if you were to ask really almost any professional philosopher who's the most important philosopher writing in English historically, mm -hmm. uh, they, most of them would say David Hume. And, wow. and you know, so I use the word important. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean true, <laughs> but important in the sense of you got to deal with him. You got to deal with his arguments. You got to deal with his ideas. Yeah. Um, so, uh, um, uh, he, he's a, a figure of massive importance, both uh, historically and still today. Yeah. So what was, uh, uh, so we're talking about just a huge giant within the idea, uh, within the ideas and the, the history of philosophy as well. Mm -hmm. So what was kind of the, the project that Hume set out to, uh, uh to accomplish, to, uh, uh, to look at? Yeah. So the, uh, he wanted to be the Isaac Newton of the mind, right? Ooh, yeah, wanted that's to, <laughs> attractive, yeah. He wanted to be, uh, to, to initiate and achieve a sort of Newtonian synthesis, a Newtonian reduction mm -hmm. um, that um, in, in terms of the workings of reason, uh, so that he would, he would, he wanted to revolutionize philosophy in the same way yeah. that Isaac Newton had uh, revolutionized the way we think about nature. Yeah. And that's, and that's really important for our listeners. If you go back and listen to our previous podcast, we talked about the importance of kind of everything that was happening, happening in the scientific world during this time with, uh, with all of that. So uh, right, um, right, right. The, the idea of science, even for the philosopher was taking on like a huge new Mm -hmm. uh, uh, importance and it was sure, something sure. that they were kind of all taking on sure. uh, during this time as well. Sure, yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, for Hume, like a lot of these modern philosophers, he kind of looks back at the history of philosophy. He knew the history of philosophy pretty well, um, but he looks back at it and he thinks, these guys just keep messing up. Right? <laughs> They're just wrong. Uh, they keep getting it wrong. And the reason they keep getting it wrong is because they don't understand the the one doing philosophy they mm. don't understand the instrument of philosophy which is human nature itself yeah all right so they haven't really figured out the way that reason works and then if we can figure out the way that reason works then we can figure out the problems of philosophy until we do so we're never really going to be able to to solve those problems right um so that's why he turns towards human nature. So he wants to be the, the Newton sort of of human nature of reason. Uh, and, and, what, and, and so you think about, well, so what, what did Newton do? Well, Newton, uh, <clears throat> two things about Isaac Newton. Uh, one is that he insisted on never going beyond the phenomena, mm. right? You never go beyond the observable data. You simply stick with the observable data and then form mathematical formulas that will reflect and represent the observable data, right? Um, so you never make that leap behind what you can observe. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And by doing that, <clears throat> by adopting that method, then uh, you're able to reduce the phenomena mm -hmm. to a few simple laws, right? Yeah. Now this is the, this becomes really, I think for a lot of philosophers, a lot of intellectuals, kind of a hallmark of rationality. <clears throat> your ability to um, to reduce right uh, a complex phenomena, a complex set of data, mm -hmm. to a simple set of rules or laws. That's that's that is understanding, and yep. that's what he wanted to do with human nature and human reasoning. Right? Is he wanted to say, okay, we've got all this stuff that humans do and feel and think, perceive, etc all this sort of cognitive apparatus, cognitive phenomena, you could even say, mm -hmm. um, 
can we reduce it to a few simple rules, right? That, that's what we need to do. And then we'll, uh, then we'll be able to make progress in philosophy because we'll understand the instrument doing philosophy. Yeah, Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. yeah the, and, 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 it, in, in effect, though, it reduces the entire human person, <laughs> <laughs> which, which, you know, again, in the history of ideas, the fact that this comes after, you know, people like Thomas and people mm-hmm. like, uh, uh, or just many of the other uh, Christian philosophers that come before him, mm-hmm. it really, I think, um, points to uh, a lot of what we had talked about last time, the decline of the religious authority that we can, mm-hmm. we, we don't have to take up these, these ideas or even look at them or address them. We can just ignore them <laughs> and do what we want. <laughs> well, <clears throat> or, or critique them maybe. Would yeah, be another, yeah. Another option there uh, that David Hume doesn't, doesn't shy away from <laughs> um, uh, for sure. So, <clears throat> um, probably the best kind of entryway into thinking of, uh, into understanding Hume's um, approach to human nature and to reason mm-hmm. is to start with what's called his theory of ideas. Mm-hmm. So if you think about it, one of the things that's interesting about humans um, and in your own experience is our, our ability to um, imagine things mm-hmm. and to then also carry around concepts in the mind that are not immediately attached to objects outside of the mind, Mm -hmm. right? That might sound a little weird, but just think about, I I can, if I want to, this is weird language, if you really start thinking about it, but I can see my parents' home in my mind, in my imagination. Right now, even though I'm looking at you on the screen, does yeah. that make sense? There's probably things like that you could do as well, right? Like yeah, I, I could call... picture hundreds of chairs or yeah, know, hundreds right, of different right, tables yeah. in my mind. Right, yeah, but I'm not in front of my parents' yeah. home. But I can do that, right? <clears throat> and in fact, you know, the way Hume thinks about it is that this is actually the, the, the furniture, if you will, the components of human thinking are these ideas, um, what he calls ideas, or better, impressions Impressions, right right. so that what we have is um let me let me let me clarify that a little bit there's two two kinds of things we can think about as fundamental building blocks of human reason impressions and ideas Mm -hmm. impressions are the immediate sensation so when you're standing in front of your parents home and you're looking at it you're, that is an impression. It's direct and it's immediate, right? Okay. <clears throat> you know, if, um, when I was teaching this in um, a classroom, I would always slap the table, right? And, I, and, and that sound of me slapping the table, that's the impression. It's an immediate, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it's, 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 it's hitting the senses. Your memory, or better, your copy or representation of that. Yeah. So let's say that I slap the table and then later the students are in the hall table. I was like, man, Dr. Smith will slap that table really hard. It was really loud. It kind of scared me. I was playing on my phone. I don't know, <laughs> you know. <clears throat> that they're using a copy of the impression, and that is what an idea is. So all very importantly, all legitimate ideas, all reasonable and sensible ideas are rooted in direct impressions. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. So we have two then, we can classify ideas in two different ways. There are simple ideas Mm -hmm. and uh, complex ideas. Complex ideas are combinations of (laughs) of ideas, right? So we get little, so you think about it as little building blocks, right? You have a simple perception, but then we associate things like, I said, my parents' home, right? Well, that's that's actually a complex object if you start thinking about it. Because I think there's an idea of ownership, mm-hmm. my, um, there's, a, uh, there's the idea of parents, and there's the idea of home. Mm. D- does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? So actually that is, is a complex idea built out of simple impressions. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, the, the idea that knowledge begins in um, the senses, that's, mm-hmm. that sounds good. We're, I, I'm with you so far. <laughs> so far. Right. So 
what you know, knowledge does begin. You know, Hume, like the other uh, other people uh, who follow his approach, right? Mm-hmm. Generally, he's classified as an empiricist, right? Right, and empiricists in the modern period do have the idea that that knowledge is based in the senses. Um, they're distinguished from rationalists who think that knowledge is based solely in reason, right? Um, so two different kind of camps that develop there. What, what um, about what about ideas though of of, of justice or something like mm, that? Mm, mm. How do we? How does how does Hume? Because uh, uh, I can understand you know things that you see again things that are immediately available to the senses and then our ideas draw upon those impressions. Right, right, what right. about what about other ideas of of, of justice or peace <sighs> or something like that? Yeah. So justice is about your passions in mm. David Hume's view. It's not about reason or ideas. Um, we can develop ideas about justice, but ultimately right. justice is rooted in your feelings. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe yeah, I can, this Hume guy is starting to sound good, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so we'll, we'll back up. Maybe we'll, we'll revisit that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So... Um, now this this sounds uh, so you could, could ask yourself, well, why do we associate certain ideas and not others? That's how these combinations come about. Yeah, right? yeah. And this is where Hume's very being very clever because he starts to um, he starts to 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 talk about the idea that there are certain laws, right, that are at work in the human uh, reason, mm-hmm. and um, the um, uh, there's laws that work in the human reason, like the law of gravity. They just it just happens, right? Yeah. So, so, so you think about gravity, right? It's not like anybody decides about gravity. Um, in fact, we don't really have. I mean, there's models about gravitational force, but really, we really observe its effects, right? It's just something right. that's happening, right? Yeah. Um, and um, and so we, we sort of watch it happening. And it's something similar in, in the mind, right? That is that ideas start to combine the mind according to certain laws, right? Mm. It's not as if we're sort of deciding to combine them in certain ways. We just do combine them in certain ways, right? And so, uh, for, uh, for example, um, we group things according to proximity. Right. We, we associate ideas on the, so like if two things are next to each other, right? We tend to put them together, right? Uh, we tend to put things together because of uh, sequence, right? Things mm-hmm. come, you know, impressions coming before or after. So those, in those sorts of ways, right, we start to, our ideas start to, to glob together, right? Now, some of those combinations, uh, Hume is going to say, are actually uh, nonsense. Um, and those would include a lot of basic philosophical ideas from classical philosophy like the soul uh like um um essence distinctions between substance and accident um to a lot of the furniture you could say right of classical philosophy Hume basically thinks it is just nonsense um how does he know that they're nonsense he knows that they're nonsense by because they can't be traced back to a simple impression. Mm, so again, you go with this, this, these building blocks idea, right? You start with this combination of, uh, of things. Well, you should be any, any sensible, reasonable idea. Yeah. You should be able to break it apart into its blocks, right? This is yeah, so yeah. modern. This is how we do things. But to take it apart into its blocks and then be able to trace it back to something that's directly observable. Yeah. Well, you can't do that with substance. You can't do that with the distinction between substance and accidents. You can't do that with the essence. You can't do that with the soul. You can't even do that with the self. And so he was like, those are just nonsense. Right? We just, it's, just, it's just rubbish that we need to just sweep out right, of our vocabulary and our way of understanding the world. Yeah, so in, in looking at that example there, you can really get at kind of, again, one of the one of the basic understandings of uh, uh, of empiricists that you know there's sure. that the only real knowledge here is mm-hmm. that which we can perceive 
and that and for Hume that which exists in those impressions first mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. anything that falls outside of that is right is is either unknowable or nonsense mm -hmm. or so uh, it really does begin to pave the way for uh radical skepticism or sure. moderate or how, how would you well, yeah i would say it's interesting because that i mean hume's going to take it in a skeptical direction yeah uh, somebody before him would be somebody like john locke who doesn't want to go that far uh now Hume would say for himself that he's a more consistent empiricist right? <laughs> um, what's most important here is that i think that hume sees himself as being a a good newtonian a yeah. good a good man of science in this sense he will not go beyond the phenomena, right? If I, if it can't be traced to something sensible, then it's just, notice my terminology, nonsense, yeah. right? There's no sense to it, you know? So when we talk, you know, this is, in some ways, it's very kind of, I, I don't know why this is the case, but England tends to produce people who think this way. <laughs> <laughs> that is, the, 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 even say the word sensible, right? Yeah. Like, say to you, Jason, that's not sensible. Well, <laughs> it can be said in two different ways, right? One is in like, you're not making sense. Like it, what you're saying isn't very meaningful. It could also mean it, like it, it's not traceable to sensation. Mm -hmm. For Hume, those two things go together, right? Yeah. If, if it's not traceable to sensation, it's not meaningful, right? Yeah. Not reasonable, all right? And again, this is just being, in his view, rigorous, and helping us to overcome a lot of the nonsense that has infected, in his view, uh, human reasoning over the generations. Yeah, and I've seen it. I've seen this played out in in modern times, where uh, the, the this idea can really bring on like the what, what I like to just refer to as kind of like the skeptic's humility, <laughs> where 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 they'll simply say, "Well, that you know that kind of really goes beyond sense sense perception." Right, Therefore, right, we can't really right, know right. anything about it. You know, the, mm -hmm. I'm not even trying to to look into that. Or, you know, mm -hmm. the, it'll kind of be this what I see as false humility of saying, "Well, we're uh, not even gonna we're not even sure, gonna look sure. at the soul yeah, or anything yeah. like that because we can't. We really can't." Mm -hmm. You know, so you know, I, I I see this as kind of you know just this kind of uh, humility of, of uh, but at the same time in a very skeptical uh, and I don't wanna, I don't know about this deceptive, but but pointing mm -hmm. to the idea that, mm -hmm. that, that we can't even know these things, even if we wanted to, because right, right. again, authentic knowledge lies mm -hmm. in what we lies in those first impressions or, or it has to be able to be, like you said, reduced back to that's right. Yeah. Those, yeah. Those, those yeah. first impressions. Yeah. He thinks of it as like, there's these matters of fact, which are the direct impressions. Right. Yeah. And you know, I mean, again, it's so, like the, one of the things that's fun about David Hume is he's, he's actually, he writes in English, right? Yeah. And so you can kind of feel that the fact that he's a native English speaker here, because you know, like we just think about the word facts. We want fact-based theories. Yeah, we want yeah, fact-based yeah. solutions, right? I mean, the word fact, right, carries so much cultural power with it, right? Like you know, you start saying like, you know, well, I want you know, I want a fact-based solution. Your 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 solution isn't fact-based. <laughs> well, you know, like that word just has such a, you know, uh, uh, significance, right? In, in English rhetoric, I guess you'd say. Yeah. Um, and and Hume is it, taking advantage of that, and really, in some ways, helping to shape it. So this matters of fact, right? Which are those direct impressions, and then relations of ideas, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and those are those combinations of ideas I was talking about. Now, why is it that we tend to make so many mistakes? We tend to make so many mistakes in our reasoning and adopt you know, sort of nonsense ideas um, because we go beyond the phenomena, mm -hmm. right? We start to go beyond the impressions, right? So we start to think about things like a soul or a self or um, essence, you know, what is the essence? I mean, you know, like he would say, what are you talking about essence, right? Yeah. All there is is what you can see or touch or measure or feel, etc. right? Well, once you get done, you know, doing all of that, right, with a human being, there's nothing left over to see. And so yeah. there isn't anything there, right? Like, it's not, like, there's nothing left over to see, and so there's just nothing there, right? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So, so, like, why do we keep making these, these mistakes, right? Why do, we, why do we keep believing in things like real essences and soul and God and all that stuff? 
because we're going beyond the appearances. Why do we go beyond the appearances? He says, the most frequent reason that we go beyond the beyond appearances is because of the idea of causality. Yeah. Right? We have this, this, this belief, he'll say, yeah. really an irrational belief, that underneath all of the sensible data that we could find about Jason, right, that um, there's some substance, there's something permanent and abiding, right, that is underneath, right, all of those uh, appearances and keeps on going, right? So even though, like, you've changed during your life, right, from being very small to being larger. Having right? hair, yeah. Yeah, having hair, yeah, losing <laughs> hair. Yeah, I would say it's true, right? Um, you know, really, that's just a conglomerate of sensible qualities over time, right, in Hume's view. Um, you, of course, believe in your personal identity over time and, and that you have a soul and, a, and that you're a substance and all that kind of thing. You know, again, there's, there, we don't have any reason to believe that except that we have this idea of, cause, of causality, right? That is that there's something underneath the appearances causing it to happen. Yeah. So another way of thinking about this is, you know, we see all of the different impressions and then we think, well, the explanation for those is, by, is sort of behind it. And so we can go beyond the uh, direct impressions of matters of fact in order to explain it, right? Uh, th does that make some sense? Yeah, it does. But how does he, d d would he ever, you know, get, or, or how would that maybe differ? How, how does his view maybe of, of causation or causality uh, differ from maybe a Christian view or, or Thomas's view? Uh, of that uh, well i mean he thinks that cause the idea of causality itself is another nonsense idea right <laughs> so <clears throat> now he has a critique of it um that turns on a particular definition of causality which isn't exactly say maybe the way thomas would have defined it yeah but it's so, sort of maybe a, a an idea of causality that would say common at hume's time mm -hmm. um and the the um the idea, right, of causality, say, I was just going to talk about it in a common sense way, introducing mm -hmm. it to students or something. You know, uh, we can say that, that A is the cause of B when A necessitates B, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, you know, imagine the cue ball, for those of you not familiar with pool, that's the white ball, you know, the stick, <laughs> right? <laughs> okay. You take the cue ball, and it goes, and, and you put it in motion by striking it. And then it strikes a subsequent uh, uh, ball, right? Mm -hmm. So we would say that A's motion is the cause of B's motion, right? right? Um, you know, the cue ball's motion and trajectory and force is the cause of the motion of the ball that the cue ball strikes. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, necessary connection, right? It's right, yeah. So the, once A is in motion and strikes B, right, it necessitates the motion of B. Does that right. make sense? Okay. So, so whenever there's a relationship of causality, there is a necessary connection. Right. A and B, there's a necessary connection between the two. So this is where Hume is going to, this is where Hume's going to drive his wedge. Right? <laughs> He's going to say, look, there's no necessary connection between any two events, period. Um, there's wow. no necessary connections <laughs> at all. In fact, everything is just loose and kind of hanging together and running around. Um, so how does he make this argument that there are no necessary connections? Which well, says, look, all you really observe, right, is A prior to B. Mm -hmm. A, then B. A, then B, right? That doesn't give you any grounds for saying that the connection between the two is necessary. Um, why is that the case? Well, this has to do with sort of could say, wait a second, that's that's no, what are you talking about? Yeah, whenever I see A, I get B. It's clearly there's a necessary connection between the two, right? And it says, Well, <clears throat> let's think about that a little bit. Um, you know, why do you think that A will it necessitates B? And your your likely answer is, well, it always has. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that, right? Um, that is, it all, it, it, B always, notice my word here, always follows A. That's a quantity type word. And when what you're doing there is you're invoking an inductive basis for the necessary connection between A and B. What do I mean by inductive? Inductive is, is all about 
the repetition of many instances, many mm -hmm. particular moments, right? So you take many particular moments and add them up, many particular observations, right? And then you, and you go from that to, it's always the case, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, um, um, when, you know, you know, you could, you know, <laughs> imagine, imagine a child asking you, dad, why are you turning the, putting the key in the steering column and turning it? Mm -hmm. You say, well, starting the car, yeah, on to start the car. <laughs> and, and your son says, um, how do you know it's going to start the car? Right. And he's because it always has in the past. I mean, like, you know, I yeah. mean, you know, the real explanation. I don't know <laughs> the real explanation. I just know if I put the key in the ignition and turn it, it's going to work. Yeah. You know, when it doesn't, then I call a mechanic. <laughs> you know? But the, um, but, 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 I, but my basis for knowing that, right, is, is induction it's experience right, right? Uh, I'm, I'm going from many different instances to a generalization turning the key in the ignition starts it right right Hume thinks that that move is completely unjustified uh, <laughs> and and the reason is that we don't simply because you have seen that that b follows a right doesn't allow you in every maybe in every instance observable instance of the past doesn't allow you to draw the connection that you know, all you should really say on the basis of observation is B has followed A. You can't say A always leads to B. Yeah. Right. Because that goes beyond what you've observed. You don't know that it always does. Right. The battery right? could be dead. Right. Yeah. The battery could be dead. That's right. <laughs> so this is you know a famous kind of ties into the kind of famous example of the black swan. Right. Say in your experience yeah. that everything you like say you enjoy. Um, you're a naturalist, you enjoy observing swans. And all of the swans in your area are white. And so, you know, you 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 know, after hours and hours and many years of observing swans, you reach the conclusion that all swans are white, right? Uh, and then you go on vacation to Australia or New Zealand, and darn it, you find a black swan, there right? It, is. it only Mind takes, yeah, yeah, that's right. It only takes one instance to falsify, right? An inductive universal, right? Yeah. A universal that's established inductively. So there you have to say with inductive reasoning, well, what you can say is, he must say, if you're sticking strictly to the phenomena, thus far I have observed, right? <laughs> that all swans are white. But you can't say all swans are white. white. Right. Yeah, you have to qualify it. And so since you can't say it's always, you can't say that it's necessary. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah, it's and, and this you could see how, uh, hopefully our listeners can see how this leads into uh, skepticism mm -hmm. uh, where, we, where we can start to say, well, if I can't, if I can't say anything with any cert certitude, then it mm -hmm. can be otherwise. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. So just as you say there is a God, I can simply say there is no God. Uh, um, because the, 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 the possibility of it uh, has to always remain because you can't really have these certitudes about mm. causality or, or anything like that. Now, do, does this at any point kind of um, undermine his whole project of trying to come up with laws <laughs> of, of reasoning? Like, it seemed that it mm. would because, I mean, mm. if you're trying to establish laws, like, I get these impressions and the mind does this with them. Mm -hmm. Couldn't you just say, well, that doesn't, just because you get those impressions doesn't, the mind doesn't just do that, you know? I think he likes to talk about it that way. It just does it. It just does it. Okay. Yeah. You're like, <laughs> again, and, and you need to stop with trying to like, there's just phenomena. And then you think about say a uh, law of nature in, in early modern science is different than a natural law. Like the yeah. way Thomas would say it. A law of nature really is just a statement of regularity. It's really just a statement that A then B, A yep. then B. <laughs> you eat water to 100 degrees Celsius, it boils. Yep. Tomorrow, A to B. <laughs> That's right, right. Yeah, no, you might dig in your heels here and say, oh, wait a minute, Hume, you're being stupid. Okay. Yeah. We, and, 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 and here's why. You might, you might argue this way. Look, when something has always been a when A and B are always associated in the past, right? Mm -hmm. It is of course reasonable. Yeah. Right. 
to say that they will be so in the future, right? Yeah, if all things remain the same, it should be, right? That's yeah. right, that's right, right. And so we can reasonably say always, A always leads to B, right? Yeah. Uh, because when something has always been that way in the past, every observable instance, then it is reasonable to project into the future. Right. So he was, uh, <laughs> this is so good. <laughs> he was so clever. Um, he says, um, oh, no, sorry, that won't work either. Because what, you, <laughs> what, you're, what you're presuming is what's called the uniformity of nature. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that is that the same thing will act the same way under the same circumstances, right? And Hume says, you've got no evidence for that. It's just, it's just, a, it's just a bias. It's just a, a, a nonsense idea, right? You may claim, right, that, you know, that we can know the sun will rise tomorrow because it always has been, it yeah. always has, but you don't know that, right? You're, you're just presuming that the same thing will always act in the same way. And again, you could say, wait a second, Hume, that, the uniformity of nature is obvious because that's the way nature has always behaved. But yeah. there, you know, what, what Hume would say is you're just begging the question. You, yeah. you're, you're supporting the uniformity of nature by citing the uniformity of nature, right? Yeah. So yeah, I just want to I just want to point out here to our <laughs> listeners the complete impracticality of empiricism. <laughs> well, even, actually, Hume's got something to say about that. Oh, he does. Okay, yeah, of course yeah. he does. Yeah. <laughs> like, if we don't, if if we don't, uh, uh, you know, if we don't work on the ability of, you know, oh man, I don't know if my if this key will start my car. <laughs> What do, what do I do? How will this, I mean, I, I, there's, I cannot know that. What do I do? Or I'm driving down the road and I begin to doubt, you know, my brake pedal. I don't, That's I don't right, yeah. I, yes, it's always, if I push this pedal, it's always stop my car. But what if it doesn't? I don't know that. Like, like no, nobody. And even, I remember even reading a great quote, um, you know, by, by Pope Benedict talking about, you know, if the, the, the human mind, you know, practically speaking doesn't need sure. to have direct knowledge of everything in order for it to to live to live life or to to live in this way that you do have to you do have to uh, <laughs> live in some way uh, uh like this yeah Completely i mean he, uh, yeah I mean, uh, obviously hume doesn't have a very high opinion of the pope of rome <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> right. i mean catholicism is full of things that go beyond uh, the phenomena, right? <laughs> the most notorious and worst example being transubstantiation. Oh uh, yeah, his view, right? Um, but uh, in any event, he has. Uh, if you ever want to read something thoroughly uh, aggravating, you should read uh, his uh, book on miracles. But anyways, uh, his critique on, of, on miracles. But um, anyways, so you see the force though of this, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is I, I actually fine if I. If I sound like I'm enjoying talking about Hume, I kind of am because he is so clever. But also, you know, he's actually kind of useful mm -hmm. in an odd way. People will say all the time, well, we just need to stick with what's observable. Let's just stick with the facts. The facts. Right? Science. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Even right now. Right now. I, I, I've heard that almost every day. Right, We right. need to be looking at the science. The science. Right. Yeah, yeah. And what I want to say, folks, have you really thought this through? <laughs> <laughs> right because the truth is if you want to just stick with the facts let's go read david hume yeah. right and what hume ends up saying really is that you know we don't know anything beyond the phenomena all we can really do is quantify the phenomena and predict it right um but really even the predicting part we really can't do because prediction depends on what the uniformity of nature. So actually, <laughs> what you start to do, right? If you're yeah. going to be radically empirical, yeah. be like let's be, let's just stick to the facts, right? Actually, science doesn't even hold up because you can't make scientific uh, predictions, right? Because predictions in science depend upon the idea that A will continue that under the but same set of circumstances, yeah, yeah, A will act the same way, right? Well, for all we know, gravity will work differently next time, right? You know, for all we know whatever right now so d does that make sense yeah like, absolutely right yeah. once you adopt this this perspective so what at the end of the day what hume is saying look there's no necessary connections between anything yeah right? everything is loose that's the way he likes to put it right and um and uh and, and for that reason 
we must not go beyond the phenomena because the very idea of causality itself is nonsense. See, see, right. and that, that right there, like, it, it seems though that that goes directly against his whole project of trying to create law or trying to get at laws of how the human mind yeah. works. They're not causal laws. They're, 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 it's just the way it is. They're descriptive just, laws. Yeah. Just, okay. yeah this happens. Oh, a gosh. should be a the B. <laughs> right. Um, so the, uh, actually, I mean, you can see like how powerful in a way, this is a powerful line of argumentation. Yeah. 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 Now, Let's, uh, let's let's address your concern about how impractical this is. <laughs> okay, Hume will concede that what he is saying cannot be taken into the marketplace, as he puts it. He says these thoughts are for the library. These thoughts are for our parlor in the evening when we're <laughs> drinking wine and smoking cigars or whatever. Yeah. Drinking whiskey, not wine. He's a Scot. Um, the, you know, you're drinking, you know, you're drinking, uh, you know, whiskey and, and smoking a cigar and you're talking about reason and speculative ideas and so yeah. forth. That's for the, this is for the parlor. It's for mm -hmm. the library, not for the marketplace. This here, he introduces a, like this key division. It's one of the most important divisions in um, modern philosophy between the three theoretical and the practical. Yeah. Of course, St. Thomas and, and many uh, scholastic theologians would, would recognize a distinction between sure. practical reasoning and speculative reasoning or theoretical reasoning, but they didn't divide the two, right? They didn't yeah. say like the two have nothing to do with each other, right? St. Thomas, in fact, thinks that, you know, you, what you know speculatively, truth, right, is what's applied practically yeah. by practical reason, right? The modern philosophers really start to divide this. And, and you can see it comes out in Kant with a lot of force, sure. especially in reacting to Hume. And, and so you, what you get in Hume is, look, I, I know we can't live like this, Jason, um, <laughs> but um, let's, stop, let's stop pretending that we know things theoretically that we don't know, mm. right? And let's not, let's, most importantly, let's not let this metaphysical nonsense guide our actions outside of the library right so once we once we've eliminated this nonsense in theory mm -hmm. right and purified our minds of it then we don't need to let that affect us when we're engaged in the marketplace yeah. so you could say okay hume uh, well, what the heck should guide us <laughs> <Right? laughs> you know? if it's not our view of reality what should yeah so do you want to know what the answer is, Jason? Uh, I don't know if I do, but <laughs> maybe you tell me. Okay. The answer is passion and custom. All right, I'm in. I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> passion and custom are that's what's left to us, right? Yeah. Because theoretic, you know, in terms of theoretical reasoning, we don't really know very much. Um, we can, you know, kind of describe what has happened, and sure. that's fine. But we can't infer from our descriptions anything about the future, right? So <clears throat> we really just have to leave theoretical reason out of it, right? When we go to uh, the marketplace, we go to practical life. But this is so it's so interesting. But it's, I don't know why, but for some reason, this feels so English, right? <laughs> <laughs> so what you do is instead you follow your sentiments and custom, right? Yeah. And that's... Um, that serves as the basis of your morality then. Your basis of your morality, the basis of your conduct, the way you you operate, um, and and you know, Hume really thought actually this is perfectly sufficient uh, in order to navigate your life. Now, something that's really interesting about Hume mm -hmm. is well, there's a lot, and it kind of depends on how far we want to go with this. But I'll just kind of paint some broad brushes here. Sure, paint with broad brush, a couple of strokes here. Uh, one thing that's interesting about Hume is he's actually in his time, he was politically a conservative. Mm. Uh, that is, he was in his own historical setting a Tory, um, and it had to do like like what? Why would how would he have argued for for being a Tory? Uh, that is, for having you know sort of a, um, inherited right, the importance of the nobility, importance of the monarchy, etc. Right? Will you argue for it on the basis of custom? <laughs> this is the way it has always been. They That's a sufficient explanation. <laughs> <laughs> right? I don't have to say anything more. 
right? Uh, yeah. Because theoretical reason doesn't tell us anything about what we should or should not do. Yeah. There's a famous phrase that David Hume has uh, where he says, reason is and ought to be the slave of the passions. And uh, he literally says that, right? Um, and then the 20th century turned that into a bumper sticker. And, or the 21st century turned into a bumper sticker and uh, uh, integrated into the, uh, to the curriculum of every school. Exactly. That's right. So wow. Hume, Hume is one of the, he isn't the only version of this, but he is a spa, one of the main people who espouses what's called emotivism. Mm, and that's mm-hmm. the view that, that morality involves not, does not involve reason except in a secondary or tertiary way, but the foundations of reason are, are emotion, right? Yeah. Feeling. And that when you make, when you state a moral proposition, really what you're doing is you're expressing your feelings about something. So when I say Jason adultery is wrong, I'm not actually, I'm not actually describing adultery yeah. or some property named wrongness that attaches to adultery. I am expressing my feelings of um, condemnation, right, and blame that I feel in reaction to adultery. Does that make? Does that you follow that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you can even see this in in the the modern times when people apologize. I'm sorry that you feel <laughs> that way. Like, like I'm not. I'm not <laughs> sorry for my actions. I am. I'm apologizing yeah, for sure, your feelings. Sure, like, sure. like again, that 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 the the basis of a lot of these things mm-hmm. lies upon uh, your feelings, mm-hmm. um, you know, and then you can also see here, I think where, where the importance of uh, the uh, modern philosophers understanding of freedom or autonomy comes in. Sure. Sure. Uh, yes, as sure. well that, that, right. that, you know, uh, uh, not only should these, these passions kind of uh, control your reason, um, but you should have this kind of autonomous uh, ability to, to, order your life how you see fit right yeah with yeah. everything else set aside <laughs> that's true although uh, i do want to say and this is going to be sort of surprising hume wasn't actually an ethical or moral relativist hmm. um and now we you maybe maybe you could critique him and say actually your thoughts lead to moral relativism all right sure but in terms of his own official position he wasn't yeah uh he held for what um are called uh, what's called the theory of moral sentiments, right? Mm. Um, do I, uh, how much time do we have here, Jason? Uh, we got about uh, ten minutes. Okay, great. So that's enough. So basically, the, the theory of moral sentiments is that that reason morality is not based in reason. Right? Okay, he's just is very clear. Yeah, you know that's been a mistake. We were just wrong, right? It's not based in reason. Um, even somebody like John Locke still thought that morality was based in reason. So mm-hmm. he's pushing away from that. Now there's a whole bunch of other people like Adam Smith who thought morality is based in sentiment um, and in feeling. So here's, here's the basic th- uh, argument he has. He's, he actually says morality motivates. So he would say, look, just on the basis of observation, sure. human beings sometimes do things on the basis of morality. Mm-hmm. Right. And so, and that way, he thinks morality is important, right, in terms of uh, the actions we take, right? So morality is a motivator, um, but reason is not. <laughs> reason is never a motivator. And therefore, morality cannot come from reason. Now, isn't, that's an interesting line of yeah, argument yeah, you think yeah. about it, because he's not being a skeptic about morality. In yeah. a sense, he's saying morality is important. Morality motivates human action. Um, it's just the case that but it's also the case that reason does not motivate human action and therefore morality can't belong to reason. Now, let me give you an example of this, right? Let's say that in my reason, I know I owe you 20 bucks, mm-hmm. right? And I think, oh yeah, I know I, I, I know I owe Jason 20 bucks and I start to use my reason to calculate how much, you know, start counting my pennies, and, you know, breaking up my penny rolls so I can pay Jason back, right? And, and I'm using my reason for all that is knowing the facts of uh, that I owe you $20 and knowing the fact that uh, I have $20 sufficient to pay me, pay you back. Uh, I'm going to say Hume says no. 
He says, no, right. Yeah. <laughs> I have to want to pay you back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have to have that as a desire. I have to have the feeling of obligation, mm-hmm. right? In order to pay you back, right? Uh, my doctor could tell me everything he wants to tell me about my bad habits and how they could negatively impact my, affect my health. Doesn't necessarily motivate unless I'm really concerned about my health. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Does that make wait, sense? Wait, and you can see, you can see here the the importance when Hume's talking about the basis of morality, why custom has to be there, or kind of the mm-hmm. the, the the cultural identity, or mm-hmm. uh, that sure. why that's why that's important because that'll bring in well, you know, the the English have this idea of you know justice. If you know you took twenty dollars sure. from me, that you should pay me. Should pay. That's right. That's right. That, that's that right. custom of of of, back, of, yeah. of yeah, doing that is, is very important. Right. So uh, but it this, doesn't come from your reason. It doesn't come from your reason <laughs> or from the facts, right? Or from the so, facts. Interesting, you know, so uh, here is that uh, we have a famous distinction that it becomes very important in 20th century uh, philosophy, uh, what's called the fact value distinction. So going mm-hmm. back again to our epistemology, matters of fact happen all the time in reason. Sure. Um, and reason knows matters of fact, but matters of fact are not sufficient to give you values they're not sufficient to give you an ought Mm. right and so that there's a categorical division between is and ought Mm. between facts and value and reason can tell you all the is you want to know all the the what you want to know all of the facts you want to know but you cannot derive a single ought from you know even a million uh facts yeah Mm. it's a pretty hard line yeah. So what do you, where, where does that ought come from? It comes from your yeah. sentiment, it comes from yeah. your passions, right? Now, again, really interestingly, Hume thinks that we have specific moral feelings, right? Hmm. Now, interesting, right? Yeah. And as it's not just desire and things like that, but that there are specific moral feelings. Those specific moral feelings are praise and blame, right? Uh, guilt and honor, mm-hmm. right? When I see in someone else, and act, uh, certain actions, I have feelings of praise and commendation towards them. Mm-hmm. And I say, Jason, that was great, man, what you did for your family or what you did for your friend or whatever, right? I have feel so I call your action good because it elicits in me feelings of praise. Does that make <laughs> sense? So even, your, yeah, your morality is very just self-centered. Well, it's about your action. I mean, I'm, sa- I'm saying your action's good, but it's, it is rooted in my emotional reaction to it. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> like, um, not because the act in of itself is praiseworthy, but because mm-hmm. it elicits praise within yeah, me. Like, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You can see. Oh, it's interesting. Yeah. And, so, <laughs> and then similarly, if you do something that, I, uh, that elicits in me feelings of blame, yeah. right? Then I say, Jason, you've acted badly, mm. right? That's, that's where the bad, uh, now, and then also there's feelings of guilt and honor. Guilt, sure. honor, or shame, it's not, not, get, not, uh, not guilt, shame. So honor is when you have feelings of praise about your own behavior, mm-hmm. right? And shame is when you have feelings of co- condemnation about your yeah. own behavior. You know, you, so you start thinking, man, I, I shouldn't have done that. I acted poorly. That judgment is rooted in your experience of feeling shame. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? About an action that you perform. So he thinks that these are kind of hardwired into us, yeah. right? Um, again, it's just what happens, <laughs> right? Um, now, at the very root of it, though, he has this, there's a kind of master sentiment. Because mm-hmm. you could say, okay, but why do I feel shame over certain things and not over others, Yeah, right? Why do I feel pra- uh, honor, self-praise over uh, certain things and not others? Well, one way to answer that is custom. But then, and then you can start to say, oh, are we head towards cultural relativism? Yeah. Interestingly, Hume says no. Okay. okay. We have a sort of master sentiment. And that master sentiment is the feeling of universal human sympathy. Um, yeah. And so, isn't that, isn't that nice? It's almost, Jason, it's really interesting. It's almost like naturalized charity. He thinks that, that at, at root, this is so interesting, at root, human beings spontaneously and naturally have feelings of benevolence, universal benevolence. Yeah, well without, wishing. without any cause. No, or universal yeah, it's just cause. there. It's just there. Yeah. It's just part of human nature. Uh, and that we pray, we have a tendency towards well-wishing, wishing well towards ourselves and yeah. towards others. 
And so because of that benevolence is at work there, when we see something that harms or causes pain, right, to others, we yeah. start to blame, right? Yeah. Uh, when we see something that benefits and, and delights, we, we praise. So there, it's not relativistic in the strong sense yeah. uh, because of benevolence. The ultimate rule here is benevolence. And you might say, okay, well, how are you going to convince me that I need to <laughs> behave in a benevolent way, right? Yeah. I've, had this, I've had these arguments with Hume for a long time. <laughs> so how are you going to you know, how are you gonna convince me to act in a benevolent way? He was say, I don't have to convince you. That's like convincing you to eat food. You just <laughs> do, right? You just yeah. do have feelings of benevolence. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm describing the facts about your psychology. I'm not urging on you a course of action. Yeah. Well, Dr. Smith, thank you for painting a uh, beautiful picture <laughs> of our modern culture here. It's fascinating it is. Uh, work. Uh, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, and, and again, you know, it, it, I think it's important to, you know, again, to the whole project of modern philosophy, but it, here, especially with David Hume, is to understand uh, where our modern culture really has its roots in and mm -hmm. where kind sure, of a lot sure. of the, the, the things, because I mean, I, I, you know, I read things on the internet and stuff and I'm just like, where, like, <laughs> not, not just where did this idea come from, but where did sure. this kind of thinking come from? Because right, right. I've never encountered it in this real of a way, <laughs> except, you know, <laughs> on the internet. So it doesn't really exist. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, but, it, but, it, you know, I think, I think, you know, when we, when we start to dive into some of these, uh, um, uh, saints of modern philosophy <laughs> that, uh, 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 that we can slowly begin to understand kind of the sure. progression of ideas or at least mm -hmm. the roots from where, mm -hmm. uh, these now flowering, um, uh, mm -hmm. theories are, are really taking shape in action. Right, right, right. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, Dr. Smith, I think you've uh, given our listeners a lot to, uh, a lot to think about. Uh, and I want to encourage our listeners, uh, go read, you know, some of David Hume. Uh, Dr. Smith is uh, just launching a uh, course in modern philosophy yes. uh, as well. well. He'll take you uh, kind of throughout uh, the, the 16th through 19th centuries mm -hmm. uh, and looking at the, uh, um, the important figures, the important ideas that came out of there and shaped our current culture. Um, and for all of our listeners, check out all of our content over at Catholic Studies Academy. Until next time, God bless.